Welcome back. Thank you for coming back. It's fine. Sound is fine. You're happy. Okay. So in the first lecture, two weeks ago, I began the discussion of the entity that we call culture. In English, we have a phrase which came to mind as I was reflecting on our discussion afterwards. I opened up the can of worms that we call culture, which, as we brought out in the discussion, is a concept that is, ironically, somewhat out of favor in anthropological circles. How did we get to a place where that which we study is out of fashion in anthropology? There's a, this is a real paradox, which I don't propose to answer single-handedly today, but it is at the baseline of the series of lectures. In fact, as you will have gleaned by now, part of the intention of my lectures is to reclaim and to defend the concept of culture, which I hope to do and even convince you of by the end of uh, three more weeks. The reasons for the disfavor of the concept of culture are many, probably more than we have time to go into today or even over the course of the whole series. But one reason that as a discipline we chose to no longer focus on culture and could even claim we were moving or had moved or could move past it was that our method, ethnography, was so wildly hailed by the rest of the social sciences and beyond that it seemed everyone wanted in on it, as we say in English. Everybody wanted a piece of the ethnographic pie. So our discipline has been in some danger of losing its claim to what I like to think of as the most wondrous method for understanding human beings and understanding culture that has ever been invented, that is, ethnography. And in some ways, it has been easier to focus on method and what participant observation offers in anthropology and beyond than to continue the debate on pros and cons of culture as a concept and whether that was indeed what ethnography was able to reveal or uncover. So let us retain the concept of culture for a little bit longer. If anthropology's goal is to define culture, how do we properly do so? Anthropologists have pioneered as many approaches to the study of culture on the ground, in the field, from the armchair, or the study, and conceptually, as they have to the definition of culture itself. The history of our discipline is as much concerned with the methodological question as it is with the definitional one. The two are inextricably linked. Inspired by the American Geertsian tradition, but equally informed by the Durkheimian and Weberian schools that emphasize collective ideologies and individual constructions of and participation in ideologies, I want today to consider what relation our object of study has to the way we have studied it. This question, what the relationship of culture is to our method of approaching it, underscores almost exactly a century of debate about how we are most likely to end up locating something that is, as we have, as we have known for at least the last 25 years, not terrestrially bound. How do we find or describe something we cannot see? How do we access something as ephemeral, invisible, unlocatable as culture? It is not, as I argued a couple of weeks ago, in a petri dish. We are not going to find culture nicely bounded in a biology laboratory, and even less so in the field. So today I want to briefly trace the genealogy of our hallmark method, ethnography. Scholars differ on whether it matters that ethnography is anthropologist to claim, by the way, but I myself am quite happy to stamp ethnography as our own and claim it as anthropologies, for it is our discipline's great, if accidental, innovation. Certainly it is such a powerful research tool that now everyone wants it, as I have said. Sociologists, we can maybe accept them, behavioral scientists, mass marketing campaigns, public policy experts, students of law, finance, journalism, business, education experts, development experts, geographers. And in part, as I've suggested, it is this watering down of ethnography and for some culture as an attendant object of study that has caused the problem around culture. All of these fields now claim to do ethnography, but it is ours. And I would argue that what we do with it is unique in our intent to describe, explain, and consider the contours of culture, even if that is not what we are calling it anymore. 
Ethnography in anthropological hands does not simply mean fieldwork or conducting qualitative interviews or living with informants to participate and observe for a few weeks or months. One of the reasons I am so passionate about ethnography is that, like Malinowski, as he researched the material for Argonauts of the Western Pacific, and perhaps like every other ethnographer who has stepped off the boat or the plane or even the bus and found himself or herself or their self immersed in a different place from the one where he or she or they began that journey or voyage to get there, whether it be half a world away or a different neighborhood in the same city, I was bowled over by the power of, quote, being there, unquote, as Clifford Geertz describes it, and this having grown up in many cultures. No amount of vivid writing or even acute listening can evoke the sensory experience of being there itself or oneself. There is nothing like it, as Malinowski writes in a letter following a fishing trip early in his stay in the Trobriand Islands, quote, this is Malinowski's letter, this one expedition has given me a better idea of Kirowinian fishing than all the talk I heard about it before, unquote. And this is why even a few weeks or months is an important research tool for other disciplines, by the way. Being there at all adds inestimably to research in the library, on the phone, even on Skype. Participating and observing, and crucially, being able to oscillate between the two provides more information about the way people live their lives at the cognitive, practical, and sensory levels than any other method, and anyone who has tried it knows its power. But I was not always such a fan of anthropology, believe it or not. I knew when I began graduate school that much early anthropology took place under the auspices of colonial culture, also a form of culture, by the way, and to produce and uphold colonial knowledge. This is Evans Pritchard in the field. The acquisition of knowledge about, quote, other cultures in order to support a global structure of inherently imbalanced power relations seemed to me then and still does highly dubious and anathema to an empathetic relation with the world. So I chose to study anthropology with a kind of dismissive attitude, which I can now admit. My thinking was that I would at least get to travel, and even back to my home places, as I learned about the concept of culture, even if I had to undertake what I then thought of as a highly distasteful method that was tainted with its imperial history. The plan was to hold my nose, as we say, while I did my ethnography, engaging ethically, yes, as a product of a post-colonial era, and hopefully come up with something reasonable to say about Indian ascetics, which was my first fieldwork in the meantime. It never dawned on me until I went to the field myself that ethnography could be bigger than its colonial origins, that, although it was used in imperial periods and for colonial purposes, it could outlive them and hold its own as a method of human science and the humanities all at once. I can now admit freely that I am a born-again ethnographer, convinced by the power of the method to transcend its own history. The next section is called Our Rightful Suspicion, Colonialism. The early 20th century was the pinnacle of colonial culture, most notably on the part of the British, the French, and to a slightly lesser but still palpable extent, the Dutch, the Spanish, and the Portuguese. And what an imperial power does not offer to it, of its colonies to its scientists, of its colonies to its scientists, is not worth having, to use the English expression. Or put another way, an imperial power offers unrestrained access to its colonies for its scientists. Think of Edward Said's account in Orientalism of Napoleon's expedition to map Egypt scientifically, arriving with a legion of cartographers, phrenologists, botanists, agriculturalists, translators, linguists, the list goes on and on. The famed armchair of early anthropologists, which we are so quick to critique now, perhaps does not look so bad in comparison to a shipload of ostensibly neutral or objective scientists intent on subjecting the natives to a humiliating raft of experiments pre-designed to ensure the scientific finding that they are of a lesser caliber of humanity, inferior to the scientists and to the colonists who finance the expedition themselves. It is no coincidence that anthropology began experimenting with field methods during the same period. As Talal Assad famously writes in 1973, in the aftermath of Said's text and the wake of several centuries of colonial rule by the West, quote, 
It is not a matter of dispute that social anthropology emerged as a distinctive discipline at the beginning of the, of the colonial era, that it became a flourishing academic profession towards its close, or that throughout this period, its efforts were devoted to a description and analysis carried out by Europeans for a European audience of non-European societies dominated by European power." Unquote. That's pretty powerful, but Assad's argument is more subtle still. He writes extensively about a history of power relations between the so-called West and what was still in 1973 called the Third World. But in simplistic fashion, let me just summarize by, saying, by quoting him again by saying that anthropology was the, quote, handmaiden of colonialism, unquote. Colonialism needed and used anthropology, and anthropology needed and used colonialism, perhaps in equal measure. Colonialism needed anthropology to give the empire concrete knowledge about the colonized. As Said would argue, such knowledge on the habits, practices, and religions, whether received wisdom or freshly gathered, could ostensibly confirm the inferiority of the colonized peoples, but it also gave col colonial administrations data and language with which to govern, and ostensibly the tools with which to govern their subjects better, or more cognizant of their practices and their customs, their culture, shall we say, for better and for worse. Consider, for example, the volumes of ethnological data produced by colonial administrators, officers, along with missionaries, on the details of caste, local habit, custom, gender, marriage relations, political structures, and religious practices across India in the 19th and early 20th centuries. There's a raft of them, as you can imagine. Add this to the framework of an unspoken hierarchical comparative model that, armed with such data, could justify in popular culture the dominance of one set of cultural norms, modern European ones, over another. That is to say, all the others, from the Middle East, South Asia, East Asia, and perhaps especially Africa. And what you have is both an imperial administration and a European public eager for elaborate descriptions, along with sordid details of, of so-called Oriental and African cultures. And anthropology, too, needed colonialism for its data in the early years. Colonial accounts offered some of the best on-the-ground material about what it was like in these foreign climes. Interestingly, even once anthropologists began doing the fieldwork that would provide their own discipline with data of their own, rather than using diaries and extracurricular scholarly efforts of colonial officers who were in the field anyway, anthropology still needed colonialism, now to provide access for its own. Even some of the most tender, simpatico early ethnographers, Malinowski and Evans Pritchard among them, relied on colon colonial connections and the relations of imperial powers to their own colonial territories for access, permissions, and protection, never mind logistical or administrative support. As Assad reminds us, quote, the colonial power structure made the object of anthropological study accessible and safe. Because of it, that is to say because of colonialism, Sustained physical proximity between the observing European and the living non-European became a practical possibility." Unquote. Colonialism engendered the growth of anthropology as a field-based discipline, enabling the conditions of being there in all its hardship and all its potential, but bringing with it an undeniable set of power relationships that were deeply implicated in what it meant to be in or on foreign terrain. So the, the next section is called The Accident. So I will explain my, the title of my lecture, which I realize is a little opaque. This state of affairs sounds irredeemable, and I have sympathy for my graduate student self for being as dubious as I was about this famed method of human observation. How is it possible to conduct ethnography now in a way that is somehow freed from this dark and power-laden history? My suggestion, though, is that ethnography has its own history and that it is one that is capable in the way that it is practiced of transcending, as Assad writes, quote, the uses to which its knowledge was put, unquote. It is a powerful method, no doubt, and the colonial administrations would not have used it if it were not. Precisely productive because it can get to know people and groups of people in all their fullness, in their entirety, in their complexity. I'm suggesting it is better than most methods, perhaps better than all, designed to know human beings, and I'm also suggesting that this is not coincidental. My argument is that it is superior to most methods of human science precisely because it is a fluke, 
an accident. No one sat down to create this method. Ethnography emerged organically out of the power of circumstance and the intrinsic potential of interaction and encounter. How many of you know the history of ethnography? Malinowski's time in the field. OK, good. I learned it late myself, so I'm glad to give it to you. For those of you who don't know, and I know some of you are doing a history of anthropology class, so you may have heard wind of this, this contention is literally true. Ethnography has an accidental history, thus the title of the lecture, The Accidental Method. As I said, my contention is that ethnography is as good at what it does because it is an accident. As I say, no one could have planned it, and this correlation is no accident. It is only by such a set of unanticipated circumstances that we could have derived such an excellent, open-ended, non-fixed, non-binary set of tools to research, investigate, and understand the human condition in its myriad formations and manifestations that we think of as cultural forms. The accidental history that I am referring to is this. Until the early 20th century, as you know, as I've been discussing, Anthropologists and early sociologists used the materials of others who had been in the field, colonial, colonial administrators, missionaries, intrepid travelers. These are three pictures of Alexandra David Neal, uh, a, French, a woman of French origin who single-handedly went to discover and explore Tibet. She was not an anthropologist, but she was an intrepid traveler who dressed up as a man for much of her journey and traveled alone or with the companionship of lamas to try to understand the t religious culture of the Tibetan plateau. So it's these kinds of accounts that anthropologists used in the early days. So intrepid travelers who were not themselves social scientists or even aspiring to be. Data was collected by the intrepid group and it was analyzed by the anthropologist at home in his, almost always his, study. Field trips conducted by anthropologists, when they happened, were short. This predilection to use other people's writing was already changing in the early decades of the 20th century, to be sure, especially with the work of Franz Boaz's organized expeditions to research Native American peoples in Canada at the end of the 19th century for his work with natural history museums. And I've seen now photographs of Boaz with uh, Leo Frobenius during the latter's trip to the US toward the end of Boaz's life and fieldwork was by that time well established. But the focused intention to spend an extended period of months, even years, of properly living with the so-called natives, so to speak, would never have come about if it hadn't been for a historical accident of both global and local dimensions. Bronislaw Malinowski, a Polish national and an Austria-Hungarian citizen, becomes a student of anthropology at the London School of Economics in 1910. In August 1914, a few years into his studies, his writings thus far entirely based on others' data or secondary sources, he accompanies a number of British anthropologists to Melbourne, Australia for the British Association for the Advancement of Science annual meeting to give a lecture on primitive religion. While Malinowski is in Australia for the conference, August 1914, the First World War breaks out, and as Adam Cooper describes it, Malinowski, quote, found himself trapped. As an Austria-Hungarian citizen, he was technically an enemy alien, and he was not permitted freedom of movement. He is not allowed to return to Britain for the duration of the war, and what was supposed to be a short trip to the South Pacific with a limited stint of fieldwork in Melanesia becomes four years, until 1918, or the end of World War I, when he is finally free to leave. The Australian authorities are not quite sure what to do with him either, but they allow him to stay in the region and they permit him to do field work in their provinces or their, quote, colonial territories. That's Adam Cooper's characterization. And in fact, they clearly feel kind of bad for him. The Home and Territories Department of Australia gives him 250 pounds to help survive. And when an, when an official writes about him, quote, we may as well help the poor chap since we'll have to support him anyway, unquote. The LSC, the London School of Economics, also tries to help, sending him 100 pounds in 1915 and again in 1916. Thus is the extended immersion into participant observation born. And Malinowski, too, is a convert to extended fieldwork, not having planned it to begin with. Four elapsed years and three expeditions later, 
The first lasted seven months from August 1914 to March 1915, and the second and third each lasted for a year from May 1915 to May 1916, and then October 1917 to October 1918. By the end of this period, Malinowski is ready to argue for extended living with the natives themselves, quote unquote, and create a new methodology for anthropology as a way of understanding culture. This is a quote from Malinowski. What is then this ethnographer's magic by which he is able to evoke the real spirit of the natives, the true picture of tribal life, unquote. And famously, he instructs his readers, imagine yourself suddenly set down, surrounded by all your gear, alone on a tropical beach close to a native village, while the launch or dinghy which has brought you sails away out of sight. Or, but the ethnographer, capital E, has not only to spread his nets in the right place and wait for what will fall into them, he must be an active huntsman and drive his quarry into them and follow it up to its most inaccessible lairs. He actually looks like a little bit of a rock star in the Trobriand Islands. This is from 1918. Or, famously, I shall invite my readers to step outside the closed study of the theorist into the open air of the anthropological field, paddling on the lagoon, watching the natives under the blazing sun at their garden work, following them through the patches of jungle, and on the winding beaches and reefs, we shall learn about their life. An observation, by the way, from this photograph you can see is clearly both ways, from the observer to the observed and the observed to the observer. Now, we can see that he is still operating in a colonial mindset. He is in his uh, camouflage whites, I suppose we could say, in his desert whites, forest whites, island whites. Um, but he is clearly enchanted and wants to spin us into his web in order that we, too, can focus on the famous quote, the imponderabilia of everyday life, which is the famous result of ethnography. My own teacher, A. Thomas Kirsch, like to talk about how being stuck in the South Pacific contributed to Malinowski's own personal myth. And no doubt it is part of the myth of our methodological history as well, true as it is. Fieldwork remains a kind of internal anthropological myth, or has even an internal anthropological mystique, whereby we talk about how you can't teach it except by doing it, except by being there. And faculty members at universities all over the world debate how exactly to teach a method that is meant to teach itself by doing it. It had been a long time since I read Argonauts of the Western Pacific, uh, which I did again for this lecture. And Malinowski's quotes really do pack a punch, as we say in English. You can see how fieldwork was promoted to a new methodological way of life, a new modality of working with culture and cultural others by this text, seemingly single-handedly. The publication of Argonauts in 1922 is thus the beginning of ethnography as we know it. And for all our hand-wringing, as Clifford Geertz puts it in Works and Lives, about both representation writ large and even the diary of Malinowski about the process of keeping field notes in the Trobriand Islands writ small, that is, the real life of the ethnographer struggling to make himself manage and his studies take off in the faraway Pacific, it is much the same, almost exactly 100 years on. It worked, it continues to work, and it is one of the great contributions, as I have said, of anthropology to the social sciences. For all the disagreements between and debates among anthropologists about the study of culture, about what the human condition in its cultural form looks like, and whether we have anything that we may leg legitimately consider a solid element or contribution on the part of anthropological or cultural theory, we might agree on this, the power of the method. So the third section is called an ethnographic example, another accident. Some of you a, a couple of weeks ago said, please make sure you include some of your own ethnography. So I have, feel, I have felt free to put some of it in. So as I've told you, I was very suspicious of anthropology and particularly ethnography when I began my field work, believing that colonialism had marked it forever. I knew I was not a colonist, and I certainly hoped not, but I still had to do field work. But when the day came close to leaving for field work, I panicked. A friend had asked me 
So, what is this method? You wake up, you have breakfast, and then what do you do? And I realized I didn't have the answer. So I ran to my advisor's office, already ready to get on the plane. And I tell this story in, in Wandering with Sadhus. And I say, so what do I do when I get there? And my trusty advisor, Tom Kirsch, gave me his steady and sage advice. He said, ah, I will give you the advice that my advisor, Cora Dubois, who was the first woman tenured in the Harvard Department of Social Relations, and herself a student, I think, of Boaz and Grober. I will give you the advice that my advisor, Cora Dubois, gave me. I was ready. I was ready to write it down and make all the notes and file it away and research it further. And he said, take a lot of pencils and be careful of the dogs. <laughs> I was aware that he was initiating me into his lineage of field workers and that it was a ritual moment marking the fact that I was about to begin this mythical period of ethnographic life. If I succeeded, I would become a real anthropologist, perhaps, someone who would derive her materials from a truly in-depth study of a community or a set of communities of people whom I could not claim to know from afar or from a time before I arrived on the ground, equipped at least with a paper and a pencil. But it was not very reassuring to someone about to get on a plane. Now, 20 years after the fact, what I realized he was really telling me is that the trick of ethnography is very simply to try being human in another place and time and see if it makes a difference to being human at all. How is it to see the world and live experience through another or multiple other prisms of meaning? Some things, most things perhaps, do make a difference. These are a couple of shots from Hardwar, which is where I spend a lot of time doing field research, about five hours north of Delhi. The light, the colors, the temperature, the smell, the taste, what we think of now as sense and affect, the language, of course, and most importantly for anthropologists of my generation, where Geertsian cultural anthropology was still the mainstay of the field, the meaning of the cultural symbols that presented themselves or that were there once we started to dig in the right places. Even seemingly fixed attributes that didn't feel different as such, such as my gender or my age at the time. This is a photograph from 2016 with one of my long-term informants. Took on relative qualities that needed to be put into a new context and fit into a larger whole in such a way that they were recalibrated and had different meanings with implications for action, representation, self-presentation, and all important interaction. And this picture resonated with me. Part, it's only from a few years ago, but um, when I was a graduate student, I, I didn't have the photograph with me, so I couldn't, I couldn't put it in the PowerPoint for you. But there is a picture with me similarly kind of staring at an informant, trying to glean everything I could possibly get from his demeanor, from his way of being. This is Pago Baba, who's a long, long time friend and close informant with whom I'm still working, but it evoked the attempt of the ethnographer to get inside someone's mind. I arrived in the field armed, too, with concrete research questions. Of course, we needed our research proposal. And those questions seemed pretty sophisticated to me, I thought, and eventually, I hoped, to a funding body that after some time, I must admit, agreed to sponsor my field work. So I have a few photographs of Indian ascetics taken by my friend uh, Thomas Kelly, who's a professional photographer and has a series of quite wonderful images of sadhus or Indian ascetics that he's agreed for me to use. My question was, I wanted to know what a renouncer thought of his or her own body, when the whole point of renunciation was to leave behind all material possessions and social relations. The body, too, was material, but could hardly be renounced, what did a renouncer do with that or think of that problem? If you're renouncing everything, but you still have this, you're renouncing all material possessions, but you still have a material body, there's a paradox. Now, I thought that was a pretty nifty, sophisticated research problem that renouncers would have to deal with. And it certainly had taken me a few years of reading and theorizing to come up with the question. And I thought real life sadhus would have some lofty things to say about the matter. They didn't. Once I got my feet wet and started actually meeting with, hanging out with, as Geertz famously calls ethnographic 
participant observation, renouncers, once I could start conversing with them, I would bravely ask my question time and time again, at the beginning anyway, and I would usually be greeted either with a blank stare or a fairly dismissive shake of the head or the hand, or most often, a deep sigh. Bodies were difficult. To fixate on bodies and bodiliness, which is what they accused me of doing, or to wonder what to do with them, as I seemed to be doing and asking about, was to miss, they told me in no uncertain terms, the whole point of renunciation. I should say, they either told me in no uncertain terms that I was missing the point, or kind of waving the question away and then talking about what motivated them, not even interested in engaging with it. The point, I eventually realized, was not to fixate on them, on bodies, that is, not to be distracted by them, not to focus on them. Now, one could argue that this is a response to my research question, but really, on the face of it, they were telling me it wasn't. To them, I was asking the wrong question, and not infrequently, they told me so directly. So I had to adjust. As we say in English, I had to play it by ear. I had to go with the flow. This, too, is a kind of responsiveness to the exigencies of circumstance. We have to respond to what reality puts in our way, and reality is the best teacher. I am suggesting that this responsiveness is the crux of ethnography, the accident, and the crux of why it is such a good method. I had to learn to listen to what was important to renouncers. What did they talk about when left to their own devices, when I just sat and observed rather than interviewed? How did they answer my sometimes misplaced questions? In what tone of voice or manner of responsiveness? With what demeanor? And by contrast, where did they become animated and alive as compared to the drudgery of the topic of the body, which is where I wanted to put my energy? The answer in this case was space. This is a photograph uh, of probably hundreds in this picture. Uh, a renouncers at the Kumbh Mela, a great festival gathering of ascetics. And they wanted to talk about these festivals in terms of where they had been, where they had come from, where were they headed, who had they seen when last they were in a recognizable place, how had they journeyed from point A to point B, how was the trip. Slowly, slowly, I pieced together how my question, the nature of the body from a renouncer's point of view, fit together with their answer, where they had been and where they were going. Renouncers felt most at home, I suggested, in their bodies in the world when they were on the move, connecting with each other on a large spatial circuit, sometimes consciously mapped onto a regional pilgrimage map. In such a way could they claim their identity as renouncers of the householder world. They were a community who belonged not to a single place, but to a region, a landscape. Thus, they, thus could they claim that they operated on a mythological or celestial terrain that befit their roles as aspirants towards a transcendent lifestyle and moral calling. So that is one internal, the emic, if you like, the ethnographic, the indic view of how renouncers fit themselves into space, place, and yes, the body, in relation to each other, and in contradistinction to the householders against whom they place themselves in polar or binary opposition. And we can go back hundreds of years, not only in ethnographic terms, but in textual terms, to look at the Samyasa Upanishads, the renouncer texts, to talk about what the importance of being on the move and the importance of actually denying the body in order to do so. If a householder stays in place, that is someone who's married, who has not been an, who's not an ascetic, the renouncer wanders. If a householder stays at home, in a village or even a town, the renouncer lives in a region, on a cosmic landscape marked by deity parts or divine myths. But there is also perhaps a universal aspect to the stories I heard as renouncers met and compared notes on their travels, their wanderings. It is a specific ethnographic tale that I am recounting to you, but also, in this case, a generalizable one. They were catching up, as far-flung members of any community do, when they meet again in person. Where have you been? How did you get here? Who did you see in your last place of refuge? Think of a conference and how we all compare notes on shared acquaintances or shared reference points from our common professional pasts. How is Professor Heidelberg? Did you see my fellow student at the last workshop? Will you be going to the AAA? And so on. Why would it be that such a discussion would be an appropriate response to a question about bodies? Was it just a distraction? 
an attempt to redirect me to a more pertinent community conversation so that I could get at the real meaning inherent in renouncers' lives? My suggestion was that from the perspective of the Indian ascetic mindset or worldview, the one that my ethnography was based on and wished to understand and elaborate, these placemakers in the world that renouncers were describing to me, particular pilgrimage locations or the points on the map that renouncers used to narrate their journeys past or future, were analogous to their bodies. There's a lot of material about how the terrain of India maps on to a deity. This is Mother India, that just one deity who you can see is put in hundreds and hundreds of images onto the map of India itself, or multiple deities. In other words, the landscape and the body are thought of in parallel forms. Mountains are homes to gods. Temples are locations of divine body parts. The rivers are living goddesses, and so on. So there is already a conceptual or symbolic base from which to infuse life into terrain. In other words, it made sense. Even though the question about the body didn't inspire them, the response about space, there is a link once I pushed deeper into the, into the territory, shall we say. But I wanted to put it, push a little further still from, a, from an Advaita Vedanta or even a Samkhya point of view, which are the two most prominent Indian philosophical viewpoints, which filter down into popular Hindu thinking about the ways in which the phenomenal world is illusory and must not be held onto as real in its own terms, both particular places and particular bodies are tools to use as we make our way in the world. This is a particular yogic practice that is about bearing heat. Answers about space and place were therefore about the body. How do we manage the naming and placing of material forms in the world when we know that, in the Hindu view, ultimate reality is formless and has no name? That is the point of renunciation. By talking about place, we talk about ourselves in embodied form. Such was, I argue, the link between my question, which bored my informants, and the question that actually motivated them. My question, what do you do with your bodies, was not the same as theirs. Where have you been lately, and where are you headed next? But it was parallel. It was linked. It was linked in a series of ways, which I hope I've explained. They were two levels, I suggested, of the same question. The researchers, theoretical, abstract, and the embodied person living his or her life, practical, on the ground. In the later stages of my fieldwork, I could ask some of my close informants if this interpretation was right, and they confirmed that it was, while still correcting me and making sure I never got overly sure of myself. There was, there is, always more to be learned. And things are always changing and multi-layered in any cultural worldview, so we will never run out of data and never run out of questions or things to corroborate. It does not always follow that the research questions we bring to the field correlate evenly with the living question motivating the people with whom we immerse ourselves. But it is always our job to figure out what, if anything, the relationship between those two questions are. We cannot assume that what we want to know is what mobilizes our informants, but we do need to find out what matters to them, and then, carefully, studiously, establish whether our prefabricated question relates to what is relevant to the people in our field site or not. It is revealing in both directions. The first question says something about us. The second question tells us something about our informants. And since ethnography is about the encounter in any event, the relation between these two questions, the one we bring to the field and the one the field brings to us, is an appropriate way to begin understanding that encounter and to begin understanding the culture we wish to study. So the last brief section is called The Power of the Human Encounter Lies in Accidents. There is an important and vast literature about where ethnography fits into the methodological rigors of social science or alternatively, the humanities. Is it objective? Is it representative? Is it a social science? Or is it, in the spirit of translation, a humanities subject? How do we corroborate data if it is as subjective as it seems, if it is a personal interpretation? How do we ensure that an ethnography is about our informants and not about us, 
the ethnographers, if we, the ethnographers, are the ones doing the interpreting? Can ethnographies be productively compared when they speak about the same society, or different villages in the same nation, or region, or different locations or contexts altogether? What about the all-important power relations that colonial history that taints them so? Is it possible to leave such a legacy behind? What about the politics of representation? This lecture can't go on and on and on and on and on to answer all of those questions, but this is why ethnography is such a powerful object of study itself in our discipline, and we can certainly discuss any or all of them in more detail in our discussion section, because they are important, meaningful questions with real implications for our methodology and for our discipline. For now, though, I want to wrap up by asking a different but very pointed question. What is so effective about participant observation? How and why does it work? My contention is that this rich, full, real-life method started as an accident, and necessarily so. No method, as attuned to the changing realities of human life, could have been planned. But further, I'm suggesting that the accidental, accidental nature of human interaction and encounter is what continues to keep ethnography vibrant. It is always open-ended. Human encounter, too, depends on the accident of open-ended exchange. Something happens in a face-to-face -face meeting, and further still in the immersion of a previously foreign world both ways. There is nothing to be determined, but only to be experienced. That is what it means to go with the flow. And this is true both at the level of the question and the answer, as I've tried to indicate with my own first field work. Both need to be continually responsive, as does the anthropological self that is conducting the ethnography. So I'm suggesting that it is no accident that an accident produced the most nuanced and complex method there is to study humanity. We cannot plan accidents. Ethnography can and must acknowledge and can and must honor that culture is not predetermined and that we are each beholden to it, even as we infuse it. We are each beholden to it in the way we receive actions, interpret actions, engage in actions. As I say, even as we each infuse it with meaning and actions of our own. Ethnography can only take place in the spirit of coming to know the other as equal to, and even sometimes as, oneself, despite all differences, despite the fact of the other and the self being other from each other. This is both exceptionally simple and exceptionally difficult. To avoid or eschew or resist the ranking of humanity by race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, among countless other categories, is near impossible. We naturally categorize, and categories are all too easily ranked. But equitability lies in empathy, and my suggestion is that participant observation, ethnography, is a method of empathetic, or can be, can be now, a method of empathetic immersion. A participating, observing ethnographer asks, how is it to be someone else, or to be in a place where people are formed in a different way than the way the ethnographer was formed? It is both a formidable tool of knowledge and a humbling exercise of great compassion. Sorry, it's not a very good slide. Alpa Shah argues in this wonderful article, Partic Participant Observation, a Potentially Revolutionary Praxis, that ethnography is a potentially revolutionary praxis, quote, because it forces one to question one's theoretical presuppositions about the world by an intimate, long-term engagement with and participation in the lives of strangers, unquote. And it is within anthropology's grasp. Let me end with one last example taken from our anthropological ancestors. As I argued last week, anthropology's strength lies in its history of attempts to understand the co-constitutive elements of sameness and variation across human societies. This process I am suggesting today is not just an intellectual engagement, but a practice-based experiential one. And it really does work, from Malinowski, through Evans Pritchard, to Jensen, to the ethnographers of today, all of you. Ethnography is about sense-making, on both the making sense level and on the sensory level. Through ethnography, we become them. The I becomes the other. 
And remarkably, this is true even among those ethnographers enabled by colonial privilege and perspective. That's the slide, and this is the real object. Consider Evans Pritchard's famous text, Witchcraft Oracle and Ma Oracles and Magic Among the Azande, rightfully hailed as a way what was considered, quote, primitive logic could be rational too. But this is not just a philosophical expose, although certainly Evans Pritchard must have been influenced by British analytical philosophers. Through his in-depth fieldwork, long-term engagement, Piff Helmet and all, maybe, just maybe, the Western logical colonial anthropologist can come to see the world the same way as the native. And I love so much this one moment that the pith helmet wearing colonial, colonially enabled ethnographer writes, I have only once seen it, I have only once seen witchcraft on its path. I had been sitting late in my hut writing notes. About midnight, before retiring, I took a spear. I took a spear. You know, that you can you can see that life has infused him to some degree. He had only once but he has seen witchcraft on his path. I took a spear and went for my usual nocturnal stroll. I was walking in the garden at the back of my hut amongst banana trees when I noticed a bright light passing at the back of my servant's huts towards the homestead of a man called Tupoi. As it seemed worth investigation, I followed its passage until the grass screen obscured the view. I ran quickly through my hut to the other side in order to see where the light was going to, but did not regain sight of it. I knew that only one man, a member of my household, had a lamp that might have given off so bright a light, but next morning he told me that he had neither been out late at night, nor had he used his lamp. There did not lack ready informants to tell me that what I had seen was witchcraft. So as I say, even the colonial pith helmet wearing Evans Pritchard comes to see witchcraft himself. This is a powerful statement about human porosity. As Alpha Shah argues, knowledge through participant observation is accrued, quote, not only by speaking with others, but through becoming, in practice and in part, others, unquote. When even the colon colonial era anthropologist can come to see witchcraft, we know we have a method that is capable in its scope, and that we hold great potential as human beings to transcend ourselves in our efforts to come to know each other. Thank you.